Jamel Presley grew up less than a mile from the College of Charleston and graduated from Burke High School. He was as hard-nosed and spirited as any player I have ever coached. On the defensive end, he always guarded our opponent's best scorer. His jump shot was picture perfect, and he iced many games with his foul shots. In fact, in his senior year, he ranked fourth nationally from the foul strike. He played in the backcourt with Anthony Johnson, and they made a magnificent duo. In an NCAA game against Stanford at the United Center in Chicago, Jamel was voted Chevrolet Player of the Game. After graduation from the college, Jamel has given so much back to the community. He presents to youngsters seminars in SAT taking and academics and conducts clinics and camps teaching the ABCs of basketball. He is also president and CEO of the Day Foundation. Jamel, congratulations and a big thanks for your contributions and the role model you have become for the youth of Charleston. President Benson. Fundamentally mindful. And tonight, only recipe edition, we got Jana Carter talking about nutrition. Harry Cornell focusing on academics. And myself will be talking about skill development. Day TV, Fundamentally Mindful. Welcome back to the nutrition segment of Day TV. This is Janet Carter, registered dietitian at MUIC. And last week I started talking about different food groups. And today we're going to talk about the grain group. A lot of the foods in this group are considered carbs, which a lot of people think are bad for you, but they may or may not be. So we're going to discuss that a little bit. There are a lot of healthy foods that are in this group. And the healthiest ones are going to be the whole grains. So that's going to be whole wheat bread, brown rice, whole grain pasta, and things like that. The white rice and white bread and white pasta, those are not so healthy for you. Those are called simple carbohydrates, and they're not as healthy as the whole grains. Um, other foods that are included in this group are the starchy vegetables. And there are four starchy, well, actually technically five starchy vegetables. There's corn, peas, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and winter squash. Winter squash is like acorn squash, butternut squash. Not the summer squash like the yellow or the zucchini. Um, those are considered non-starchy vegetables and those are in the fruit and vegetable group. So the starchy vegetables are actually quite healthy for you as well. Um, even white potatoes. A lot of people think that white potatoes are evil and unhealthy but actually they're quite healthy for you. Um, it's just that a lot of times we fry them or we put butter, sour cream, and cheese and bacon bits on them and then they're not so healthy anymore. So a lot of the foods in the grain group are healthy for you as long as you're choosing the right kinds. So that's it for the grain group this week. Last week we talked about fruits and vegetables, which are very, very healthy for you. And if you have any particular questions that you want me to address, please send them to dietjc24 at yahoo.com. Or I also do individualized counseling sessions if you have your own personal needs that you would like to discuss. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to Day TV, Fundamentally Mindful. Today on the academic session, we will discuss South Carolina sliding scale versus our neighboring states. Now, let's take a look. In the state of South Carolina, an A is from a 93 to 100, a B is from an 85 to a 92, a C is from a 77 to an 84, a D is from a 70 to a 76, and a F is from a 0 to a 69. 
as you can see in our neighboring states of Florida and Georgia, there's a little difference. A A is from a 90 to 100. A B is from a 80 to 89. A C is from a 70 to a 79. A D is from 60 to 69. And a F is from 0 to 59. Now there's a slight difference. Now you may ask yourself why. Well, here in the state of South Carolina, we we operate on what I like to call a seven-point scale, which is there are seven points between each letter grade. Now, the discrepancy comes in here when we discuss student athletes, and the discrepancy is a big one. Let's pay attention. Now, when explaining the difference and the discrepancy in the grading scale, we go to the quality points that are issued by the NC2A when calculating the initial eligibility GPA. General college prep, a A is equal to four points, a B is three points, a C is two points, and a D equals one point. If you're an honor student, a A is 4.5, a B is 3.5, a C is 2.5, a D is 1.5. Advanced placement, a A equals 5, a B equals 4, a C equals 3, and a D equals 2. Now this is what I like to call a blanket scale. These quality points are issued in a blanket way through the NC2A, regardless of what state a high school athlete represents. These are the quality points that he gets for every letter grade that is presented on his high school transcript. Dating me from your life. Shut off. Like, like I'm saying, like, he's like, 
comfortable that you gotta get out. Just go with it. That's when you pump it, you're trying to get it to where something that you think it should be in any shot. That makes sense?
Most Charlestonians have heard of Charleston County RMC, Charlie Librand. But have you heard of Patrick Bell? He's a 20-year commercial real estate broker who wants to challenge Librand in November. I had a chance to talk exclusively with him for a special edition of Quintus Full Sense. Patrick, let me start off with some developing news. The Post and Courier reported that Charleston area home sales surpassed 10,000 this year. And you know, I'm wondering, when you read that particular article, what was going to your mind? Well, you know, Charleston is the fastest growing county in the, uh, in the state. Yeah. And uh, it surpassing 10,000 is not an unusual thing. It surpassing it that quickly uh, in the year is, uh, is certainly a good thing. And I expect to see many years of it being well beyond 10,000. Yeah. Very happy about it, not surprised by it at all. Yeah. And let's move to the controversial issue right now in your race, and that is the Oak Ridge Fund, mm -hmm. which is run down by the Charleston County RMC and the RMC director, Charlie Librand. A lot of people call it the slush fund. A lot of people feel like he has basically mishandled the uh, situation. And I know on last night you sent me a message on Facebook basically saying that a lady Sharon, by the name of Sharon actually uh, complained about the interview because she felt like Charlie... Um, used that particular uh, tragedy in the in the office to basically promote his you know uh, election. Uh, as we say right now, what's your version of that? Well, uh, Shelby is, is her name, Pardon. Um, and that's a question I would rather you ask her directly. Okay. And that that was a situation I had nothing to do with. Okay. It just is it's apparent from that um, that Facebook post that what Charlie said to you in his interview right. last week. Uh, was not entirely correct. Okay. But that's as much as I'm going to say about that. And let's talk about that because Charlie responded to the controversy over the overage fund. He basically said, quote, it was per meanness. It was per politics. This thing, meaning the overage fund, has been around for 36 years. Two of my previous RMCs have used it. They're both Democrats. It didn't come up six years ago. It didn't come up six weeks ago. It came up here in the last week or two. And its sole purpose was to embarrass me. So tell me when you hear what Charlie says, what do you tell yourself? Well, let me... Uh, the only thing I tell myself is that he's trying to change the subject. Okay. Because there's two things. There's an overage account, and then there's a slush fund. Right. Um, and he's trying to make it out like the people that are complaining about it, which is not me, by the way. The people that are complaining about it are trying to get rid of the overage account. Okay. Nobody's ever said that, to my knowledge. Um, all they're wanting to do is have that account be uh, public and be accounted for and, and to be audited. And that account, according to the county auditor, uh, was unknown by anybody in the county other than, than, than my opponent right. up until a couple of weeks ago. So it's not a matter of should we have an overage account or should we not have an overage account. We certainly should have an overage account. It just should be public. And we should know what money is going into that account and what money is coming out of that account. We have not known that for uh, for my opponent's entire 20 years in office. Wow. Well, let's do something I call true and false. Okay. Charlie said this, quote, my opponent is still acting like there's something wrong, meaning the overage fund. He's out talking to many stroke alliance, stirring up trouble because they have nothing else to run on. True or false? False. Charlie says that the RMC has 20 million images online. True or false? That's probably true. Everything since 1997 has been scanned and imaged and is online. True or false? False. The historic library has been scanned and is online. True or false? Say that again. The historic library has been scanned and is online. <clears throat> That's partially true. Okay. Charlie says that you don't own any property in Charleston County <laughs> and you don't have any deed. True or false? False. Okay. Well, you know, besides politics and campaign, of course, let's talk about who Patrick Bell is. Okay. Well, I've been in real estate for over 20 years, yeah. um, both in the Charlotte, North Carolina area and, of course, here in Charleston. Okay. Uh, I've also, this has been a good decade ago, I was, when I was living in North Carolina, right. I was uh, co-chairman of the North Carolina Commission on State Properties, and um, pretty proud of that. It was, it was a good commission that was created to get rid of surplus state property, uh, sell off that property, put it back on the tax rolls. Okay. Uh, that commission was done away with for political reasons um, back in the mid-2000s, uh, the mid okay. around 2005, 2006. Uh, if it had stayed in place during the, uh, during the Great Recession, I think it would have been a great benefit to that state. Uh, 
Yeah. And uh, in my opinion, it should be something that's in place in every state. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it, it's not. So you know that, that's that. Um, <clears throat> Where were you emotionally when that was taken away? Well, you know, there were three co chairmen myself included, and uh, we basically created it. We created the rules that govern that uh, that uh, commission and uh, did a lot of work to, to get it up and running, and it, and it took several years to, to get it to a point where it could actually be sure. productive. Right. And then it was just kind of taken away from us. We were all, it was a great commission, uh, 16 or 18 of us, and um, uh, a great group of people. And uh, I think we could have done a lot of good. It was just taken away from us before we had the opportunity, which was uh, quite And, you know, during the campaign, you actually got a huge endorsement from someone who really endorses people. Let's talk about your endorsement from the Charleston Realtors and Charleston Mayor Joe Riley. Well, I'm proud of both of them. Uh, both uh, Mayor Riley and the Charleston Realtors stand for ethics and, uh, and good government. And uh, uh, neither, neither endorsement was easy to get. Yes. Both of them took uh, quite a bit of uh, conversation, uh, interviews, uh, took several months. And I'm very proud of both of them. Yes. And uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say about them. I'm very proud of them. And, you know, we um, actually, when I was talking with Charlie last week, I talked to him about the whole situation back in the day when he was actually uh, trying to get the RNC job, but he was also working as a, a full time business owner. And you have to get some thoughts about that. Well, I don't have doubts that he was working as a business owner, uh, but what he said to you last week was that he had to quit his private work because the RMC job was such a full-time job. Right. Well, uh, I have an email here in front of me that he sent to me on April the 8th, uh, basically giving me a similar answer to what he gave you last week. And uh, ever since then, I and other people have been asking the county to provide records to, to substantiate what he's saying. And, uh, and we've been stonewalled ever since April the 8th, and we haven't done anything. And, and my point there is, if you've been working so hard in the RMC job, uh, and you're, you're proud of that, and, uh, and you know, I'm proud of the service that he's given to the county, okay. but uh, if, you're, if you're proud of the hard work, you know, provide us the records. And there's plenty of records that show when he shows up to work and when he leaves. Okay. But uh, me and others have been asking for six months and we've received nothing. And that's, um, that's concerning. So that describe to me the following one word, politics. That's a great question. You know, um, politics should not come into play in the RMC race. It really shouldn't. The, in my opinion, this race should not even be partisan. I do believe it should be elected. Uh, but I do not see a reason why it should be a partisan race at all. So that's all I have to say about politics as far as the RMC race goes. Commercial real estate broker, in one word. Hmm. Challenging? Yes, yes. RMC, in one word. Hmm. Um, that's tough to put in one word. Community service. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Your parents. Hmm. Um, role models. Yeah, Lake Wiley, South Carolina. Home. Yeah, Patrick Bell. Wow. Um, community servant. Yes. Your future. Um, my my future in one word. Um, community service. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, Patrick Bell, this was so great. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thank you.
Crawford. Wallace Spearman is there as they come for the home straightaway. And here we are with Ivory Williams also joining them. And now it is Sean Crawford that takes command and pulls away here at the finish. Sean Crawford, a convincing winner, 1973. 19.73. It is wind 80, one of the fastest times ever run at 200 meters. And I told you, all he does is run that turn and hang on. And we're going to get a look at Sean Crawford and how he was able to dominate this field. This really should have been closer, but when you run the turn as well as Sean Crawford does, you simply put pressure on everyone else. Wallace Spearman did not run a good turn. Look at where Wallace Spearman is just outside of the side of your camera right now trying to make up ground which he does he holds on for third Charles Clark the NCAA champion from Florida State hangs on for second and Sean Crawford's your champion So we're here at Day TV and Fundamentally Mindful. We're here today with Dr. Andrew Safer. How you doing today, big guy? Great. Thanks for coming. Good. Thanks for having us. So we're going to get right into mm -hmm. it. Um, being a Charleston native, mm -hmm. we have a lot of things in common, uh, which is uh, Coach Crest. Mm -hmm. um, I work out uh, at the Jewish Community Center uh, where your sister, I met your sister there. Um, and so you had a lot of time with Coach Crest and coming up in basketball. Mm -hmm. But our main thing, the reason why we're here is uh, talk about the service that you do okay. um, and talk about how that relates to our modern day athletes and injury that they're they're going through. But first, let's talk about the young Andrew Safer coming okay. up um, in the Charleston area and, um, and playing sports. Okay. Um, just talk about that. Take us to memory lane. Well, I kind of definitely grew up here in Charleston. Uh, my father was very athletic. Uh, got me into a lot of sports growing up and uh, kind of a shy kid growing up. And uh, my dad wanted me to go to the college Charleston basketball camp at the Jewish Community Center. And I was definitely reluctant at first, and uh, but I went um, and had a great time. I was first introduced to Coach Cress. He had that New York accent that mm -hmm. we're not used to with all the southern mm -hmm. people here in, in Charleston, and then have influx of all the people from all over the country. And uh, he just had such a passion for the game. It was just, it was just kind of exuded out of himself, and uh, really stressed the fundamentals and and hard work, and mm -hmm. uh, just really was made me have very passionate about the game. Right. I think you may have mentioned something about me just being a hard worker or some little small comment that my dad told me and I think from that point really just got me so into basketball. Nice. So I pretty much went to every camp every year down to the College of Charleston, um, just remembered just all the drills that he taught us, the fundamentals, the hard work, and just really fought all the teams growing up, just all the great teams they have when they won the NAIA championship with Steve Yetman and Greg Mack and all the great players and uh, just had this is really good memories for me growing up. Nice. So. And so you did attend the college Austin and you did majored mm -hmm. in? In pre-med, pre yes. Med. Um, I did. I, I played a little bit of high school basketball and tennis but wasn't able to get to the next level mm -hmm. uh, but majored in pre-med. I wasn't sure which where I wanted to go with medicine mm -hmm. and realized that I had foot injuries my whole life. Flat feet. I went to a very a local podiatrist here in town, Dr. Kalinsky. Helped me a lot and I right. figured out that we can do some sports medicine with podiatry and really got focused. So I, my grades really improved in at College of Charleston my junior year. got focused, knew what I wanted to do uh, with sports medicine and podiatry and, and got accepted to school in Ohio for four Good. years. And, mm -hmm. and I kind of bring us right back to the, to the same thing we're talking about because then here you're a young student athlete, mm -hmm. had foot problems mm -hmm. and you went, you went to go and get it checked out. Mm -hmm. And we also spoke to Aaron Thornton today mm -hmm. who had the same problem that right. came in and in, 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 in seen you. Um, talk about that. Talk about you know how that came about. How you wanted to really um, focus on, on on the foot injury and give some type of um, expertise back to something that you know you experienced. I always tell my patients I know what they go through. I have flat feet when I was ten years old. I had orthotics made, really helped me, but I had a lot of foot injuries going up. It was very frustrating. But I can really sympathize with a lot of my patients. Not only athletes, but diabetic patients, people that are just everyday athletes or runners. And so I think it gives me a really good perspective. I think giving back, I mean, I really enjoy treating uh, patients like Aaron. It's enjoyable to, to really treat him very simply with the custom orthotics and make him better pretty quickly to get back to soccer and basketball. So it just really means a lot to me and, 
and uh, makes me very passionate for what I do. Nice. <clears throat> and something that you, you you focus on and talk about is the is the heel, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a a common injury in youth sports. Mm -hmm. um, I won't attempt to um, um, to try to uh, to name it, but mm -hmm. can you tell the the, the the community about that injury mm -hmm. and, and how how you uh, help to um, better athletes when that comes up? Comes yeah, up. I think it's very important to, to know that anytime a patient has heel pain or you talk to your friends and, have, and complain about heel pain, it's not always a classic plantar fasciitis, which you may have heard about. It's a ligament issue on the bottom. Very important to get evaluated for it. It could be a nerve injury, it could be a stress fracture, it could be a growth plate injury like Aaron has. And I think the key is really the correct diagnosis. And in our office, we have digital x-ray and ultrasound and really able to evaluate patients in the office um, and uh, just make them better. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really key to, to, to get the correct diagnosis. Um, and it's definitely, without a doubt, most, our most common diagnosis we see. And, and But you do stress to get it done early. Without a doubt. I mean, we do have some patients that do self-treatment at home, which is fine. But if it doesn't get better in a week to two weeks, it's not really normal to have foot pain. So if you have a stress fracture and you're walking on that stress fracture and you think it's plantar fasciitis, it could go on to surgery. So I think catching it early is really the battle. If you right. get it, get it uh, treated early, that can really help and, and make you recover faster. And I think that's something that Aaron talked about mm -hmm. because he said he thought it was just a little bruise at right, first. Exactly. And he kept pushing it off, mm -hmm. putting it off, and then um, and then it you know kind of crunch time when he had to get it taken care of. But the season was coming up. Right. So athletes need, really need to you know take heed to your body mm -hmm. and, and go go get those things checked out as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> as we met, you know, earlier, uh, Dr. Safer, um, and you just, we, Day Foundation just brought you mm -hmm. on board as one of our sponsors. Um, talk about, you know, um, you know, why you choose to, you know, be a part of, of the Gus Macker of Charleston and Day Foundation and help us out with, you know, our whole thing with the oatmeal recipe approach. Okay. Well, I didn't really know much about the oatmeal recipe until we met and, and, and spoke about it, and I really think it translates into all professions, any, any profession you're really in. Um, I think you need all three components. If you're just doing one, it's not going to work. And uh, I know you mentioned the first is education. Mm -hmm. And I think for your viewers I mean, and young people, it's really finding a passion that you love. And finding a mentor, maybe spend a day with a lawyer, doctor, or a real estate agent, and just see what they do during the day. And I think once you find that passion, just try to get the highest education you can, get that degree. And I think that's very important. And also experience. Uh, I, you know, for me, I, I was able to, in residency, go to the Cleveland Cavaliers podiatrist and work with him. Nice. Unfortunately, LeBron James wasn't there at the time. He was in Akron, couldn't nice. get any tickets because he was just such a great athlete back then. Uh, but I was able to spend time with him, see him interact with athletes, uh, pro athletes, basketball at the, at, the, at the stadium, as well as go to his office and see the patients that he saw. Not only athletes, but diabetics, pediatric children, and, and seeing how they help people. And, and that's what I really love, is just making people better. Right. So. And, and, and through all that experience mm -hmm. and training, and that which what we call the education mm -hmm. part of it, you develop the skill. Mm -hmm. Right? So talk about the skill and then the important of nutrition that goes along with not only Dr. Safer's mm -hmm. everyday life, but your approach to um, carrying out a, a tremendous craft that you do. Well, without skill development, I think it goes hand in hand with education. I think trying to keep on improving yourself. Um, skill developed for me after res after podiatry school was just going to residency, trying to get the best training I could for foot and ankle surgery. And from there, never being complacent. Always trying to learn more. There's always somebody better than you, like, like in basketball, such as in my profession as well. So I just try to get training as much as I can at seminars and just try to get better at facets of my career to help my patients. Uh, social media is something that I never was trained on, but now we use Facebook and Twitter and, and, and uh, blogs to really educate our patients. So I think it's an ever evolution, uh, evolution, just try to reinvent yourself and never be complacent. Nice. And then going into nutrition, you know, I have two daughters, uh, one that's five, one that's five months, so I'm definitely tired in the morning, but I can't do anything about that right now. But I think you know, nutrition is definitely key. I know we talked about oatmeal. Mm -hmm. I've actually tried to eat healthier in the morning, stay away from the carbohydrates. It does give you more energy, and, mm -hmm. I, and I really try to set a good example for my patients. I try to keep active and exercise. I feel better by myself. I think I set a better example for my patients. It makes my mind clearer. And just, I think eating healthy and exercising is really the key. And so I think nutrition is very important. And I just think all three really need to be worked together to be, you know, to have a full career in whatever you do.
Good morning, everybody, on this wonderful, beautiful Sunday morning in Charleston. My name is Sam Regret, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening event of the 2014 Charleston Jewish Book Fest. We are, of course, thrilled to host you today, and we look forward to seeing you at all our other events, and I hope that you picked up a program on the way in or on the way out, which gives you an idea of some of our other authors, and we hope to see you all there. Um, we're working on our cultural events for the spring as well, so if you are not currently on our email list, make sure you give one of the lovely young ladies in the front there your email address and you'll know about all the great cultural events that we do at the JCC. We have two great authors this morning. First we have Tim Kelly and at noon we'll have David Green. Tim Kelly um, wrote a wonderful book on, on a basketball player, so the theme of our, our talk this morning is going to be basketball. And therefore, to introduce Mr. Kelly, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have a basketball expert do that. And that is Mr. Jamel President. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sandra Brett for having me, as well as JCC, Renika Watkins. I want to go right into uh, introducing our speaker today, which is Tim Kelly. As you know, I wrote a book about a guy named Red Klotz. And who was he? Um, he, he was a basketball legend, a Jewish basketball legend. Um, he liked to say, I've run more miles on more courts in more countries than any other human being. And it's impossible to argue with that. Uh, he's played in over 100 countries. Um, he introduced the game. Uh, his career spanned from the 1920s right up until um, his death, which was in uh, July of this year. And um, he um, devoted his life to basketball. I tell him you go out to win. I tell him to go out there and show him how good you are. Losing aside, Red was a trailblazer, laying the groundwork for today's NBA. We were doing it, making history around the world, and while they were trying to get on their feet, and incidentally, we helped them stay alive. The gold basketball has given me more adventures than most people in their lifetime. Though it's been more than two decades since he has played professionally, he still owns the Generals and his famous two-hand set shot, money. But with the 16,000 losses behind him, he'll never sink that label of loser. Losing part of life. Losing part of life. The idea is to get up and keep going. We can always learn something about the game's disappointments. It's what makes losing count for something and winning taste so good. Dating we find out life. State TV and Fundamentally Mindful, we're here today with Aaron Thornton. How you doing today, Aaron? I'm good, thank you. Good, good. So, um, we're going to go right into it, Aaron. Talk about um, that injury that's so prevalent in young athletes today. Um, talk about how did you uh, sustain the injury and talk about how Dr. Seifo was able to help you get back on the field. Well, um, first of all, it was an injury right in my heel, a uh, growth plate injury, and um, it was really really painful and it uh, it stopped some of my ability to play soccer and basketball and I had played tennis earlier on in my life and um, it hurt to run really bad and uh, like cutting too mm -hmm. that was really bad and um, I came to Dr. Safer um, one day and he uh, prescribed me to these custom orthotics and they were they were awesome I put them in the first time and the first time I had them in they uh, they helped my feet and I was able to run again and I was able to play and it got me back on the field shortly after um, the injury was at its worst and 
it's just been getting as I wore as I wear them more often. It's just been getting better and better, and um, it's going getting to the point where I'm not even having to wear them as much nice. as I used to. So the injury and Dr. Safer, I need you to pronounce that injury okay. for me. It's kind of a fancy name, yeah. kind of canal apophysitis, but I really say in layman's terms, more of a growth plate injury in the heel. So that's kind of easier to nice. say. Nice, nice. Yeah. So talk about you know after you came in and, and had the injury, just talk briefly about the regimen, the, the schedule that he had to. Um, endured to get this thing okay. taken care of. Well, it's really important to know that like heel pain in adults is usually plantar fasciitis, but in children, in adolescents, um, and young athletes like Aaron, it's, it's usually this growth plate injury. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll show you in the x-ray in a few minutes what that growth plate looks like. It's usually this repetitive force in this growth plate with our basketball players, yeah. which you play, yeah, soccer basketball. as well. Mm -hmm. And um, the good news about it is it's really easy to treat. But you really have to catch it early and treat it aggressively, conservatively. We get some custom orthotics, which I think you're yeah. still using. Oh, yeah. yeah all Stretching, time. icing, anti-inflammatories. And Aaron's a great competitive soccer player in town and, and also um, in basketball and tennis as well. So, you know, we really got him back to that sport pretty easily just with simply okay. custom orthotics and stretching and very, everything. Very shortly and very easily, too. Yeah, and one of the things we, I mentioned to him was that, you know, dealing with not only the injury, but him as an athlete, the frustrating part of it of not being out there to play. Exactly. You know, I think, you know, from, from your standpoint, you're living the service and the practice, it's, always, it's almost a must that you instill a positive, positive self-esteem into athletes because they're done at that time. Without a doubt. And we're, we're wanting our practice not to tell our athletes to stop exercising. We do low impact exercising, we really do aggressive stretching and icing, and just kind of modification to get them back to playing sports. And right. uh, I think this really easy conservative treatment really got Aaron back to playing soccer. And, Basketball yeah. tennis pretty quickly. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. So I mean, just a month or two. Yeah, that's really that. fast. So that's what's nice about this uh, this injury is that it's really easy to treat if recognized early. Early. Okay. What what other um, uh, info you might have on 
someone that maybe want to get into this industry because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of young young kids out there in school that want to get into this mm -hmm. craft. What what do you, what what um, what message you would have for them? Without a doubt, I always encourage uh, young uh, kids that are in high school and uh, grade school to come by the office and spend time. That's that's really key for me. I was able to spend time with Dr. Kalinsky in the West Ashley office. Spent time with him in the summers. I, I went to different places like Atlanta and spent time with some of the top people in our industry in podiatry. Not many people know about podiatry. It's really, really evolved over the years. Uh, we do foot and ankle surgery and, and uh, we're able to do so many things. Treat mm -hmm. kids, treat adults, treat diabetics, and treat athletes. And I think it's really the experience and, and just going out there. So I think for the young kids, just coming in and to the office and to spend a day. I right. always encourage you to come into surgery with us. Make sure that is okay and you can handle that. And, and just see what we do every day. And I think that's what's really important. And one word that mm -hmm. sums that up is called shadowing. Mm -hmm. And 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 I want that carries me into another topic okay. that I would go into is that, you know, <clears throat> what I tried to get at the College of Charleston is get student athletes mm -hmm. when they come in to have some type of business approach, right. some type of shadowing approach mm -hmm. because we're out of the job market four mm -hmm. years out of high school, mm -hmm. four years out of college. So we don't get a contract out of professional contract out of college then we got out of the job market eight to ten years. But as a student athlete, mm -hmm. or as a student, if you shadow and go into these in, into the field and mm -hmm. shadow, most of the employees were hired with from within. Without out. So um, that and so that goes into another another uh, question. And now when I ask this question, I will answer it and mm -hmm. I'll get okay. your opinion on it. Um, should athletes be paid? Mm -hmm. And my opinion is they should get some type of stipend. And Coach Crest and I talked about it, and his 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 uh his opinion was that they should get paid, but they should keep it as the amateur level, mm -hmm. meaning that athletes should get paid. My thing is that, again, energy output from a student and an athlete. You want a student athlete to put out two different outputs mm -hmm. and no compensation. So to keep it amateur, then leave us out of commercials mm -hmm. and leave the names off the back of the jerseys. Right. That'll take care of mm -hmm. everything. Your thoughts? Well, it's tough. I, I think there should be some type of compensation, but it's hard because the big sports like basketball and football are making most of the money. And so the question is whether or not you pay the same for the basketball players, the volleyball players, the golfers. And so that's that's the tough issue there. And, and, and right before you finish, let me, let me chime in because I want to make my point. So, um, and I, got, cause I left something out. What, what, what the message is that athletes are getting an education. Mm -hmm. That's the trade. Mm -hmm. So... Was North Carolina doing it right? I mean, they weren't, but, mm -hmm. you know, continue. Because that's, I mean, they were just bringing the athletes in to be athletes, to get in trouble for it, that's wrong. Right. But you're still having athletes to go to school, uh, to 16-hour, uh, uh, 16 credit mm -hmm. classes, um, um, 9 to 6, they didn't go to practice, and it's tough to do, but... That's, that's a long story. I, I rather it's, hear you. It's really tough. I mean, I wasn't a college athlete, and you know more, better than anybody what's involved. It's a lot of work. It's practice, and it's very limited time to study, and it's, it's very challenging. So, I mean, I do agree. I mean, you have that college scholarship, and that's very expensive, without a doubt, that education. But I think in some way, um, whether it's um, mentoring or, or some type of scholarship fund to, to, to help the people that can't afford basic things, such as, you know, you have the meals at, at school, but maybe you're not able to afford meals on the weekend. Or, well, we got to get we got to make gotta get our own way mm -hmm. to the institution, right? Get our own way back. Our parents got to mm -hmm. pay to get to mm -hmm. our games. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a bunch of whole different things that can no that the school can probably pay for. Mm -hmm. That can not those those funds that we have in our in our possession can mm -hmm. be used to those things as well. Without a doubt. I mean, these athletes are making a tremendous amount of money for these colleges, and I think that would be. It's very special if the college can give back to these student athletes and pay for those type of things right. to really help the, the family as well as the student athlete. And I know it's a touchy mm -hmm. subject, but if, mm -hmm. if you don't talk about it, then it wouldn't be a never uh, a, a cure Without for it. Doubt. And um, and they also talk mm -hmm. about well, different conferences mm -hmm. are saturated with mm -hmm. funds more than another. So right. then, if the athletes are getting paid, that that a smaller conference mm -hmm. can't get paid as much as that. So it is a catch twenty two. Mm -hmm. And I you know being a a, a former student athlete mm -hmm. now in business mm -hmm. with student athletes, I can sign, I can kind of see both sides, but I still favor the side of a student athlete. Mm -hmm. And I think Northwestern, uh, don't quote me, had a, a, a nice setup that when an athlete graduates, mm -hmm. then they will a stipend will be released to them. Mm -hmm. Maybe something that can last them for two years while yeah. they get on. And that's and a great program. That's 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 yeah, a good idea, good idea to think about. Definitely. 
So, um, you know, in, in closing, um, what do you see um, Carolina Foot Specialists, you know, doing with, with student athletes? Are you mm -hmm. practicing the next couple of years? Well, I actually joined up with a friend of mine back in 2006, Dr. Brown. He's also a college Charleston athlete, played baseball there. We both played grade school, basketball, high school together, so we're both passionate about sports. So that's kind of a lot of our focus is really working with organizations, um, educating young athletes, helping them. So I think that we're really evolving, like we talked about with the website and giving information to patients. Really like to get out to the public. I really enjoy public speaking and, and just getting out and explaining to young kids actually what we do for a living. It's, it's a nice field. You have a family life uh, on the weekends. Uh, and it's, it's a really nice career that not many people know about. So I think just getting the word out about what we do for a living and just try to help young kids. Nice, nice. Well, you heard it first today, TV. Dr. Safe and Fundamentally Mindful. We'll be right back. Thank you.